What we've seen so far from Alon is introduction to what zero knowledge is in general, zero knowledge proof, inter proofs, interactive proofs, and uh, uh, famous, very basic uh, central feasibility result that it's possible to construct zero knowledge proofs for all NP, meaning you can prove essentially anything that you want. In this, uh, in the next hour and a half, or maybe a little bit less, I'm going to talk about zero knowledge proofs of knowledge, which is not, uh, which relates to not necessarily to the question of whether or not the statement is true, but whether or not you know why the statement is true. Okay, so if uh, here's a motivation. Uh, someone wants to go to Tel Aviv today at the end of the day, and they want to find the shortest path from Kfar Makaviyah to Tel Aviv. And I want to prove to them that I know a shortest path, so they'll give me money so that I'll re reveal it to them. But uh, if I use the zero knowledge proof that uh, Alon presented earlier today, then all that really says is that a shortest path exists. But we already know that a shortest path exists, because the shortest path always exists. So the fact that I can prove to you that a shortest path exists doesn't necessarily mean that I know what that shortest path is. When we talk about knowledge, Knowledge is, do I, know what the actual, do I know the actual shortest path and not just know that there, there is existence? Here's another example of proving identity. Here's a very basic idea to prove, instead of using a password, I can have a public key uh, for some public key encryption scheme or something else. Here we can think about being in a group where a discrete log is hard. So we have G, which is a generator, and I have a value H, which is G to the power of X for some random X. And I'm going to, and H is my public key, and H is the way that I'm, and I'm going to prove that I am uh, the owner of the private key, that, I, that this is my identity, by proving that I know X. Okay, so that I know X, so that G to the power of X equals H. And since only I know my private key, this will prove my identity. Okay, so a way of proving your identity or via your, your key pair is by proving that you know the private key. So here's an attempt. I'll prove in zero knowledge uh, what Alon showed is that we can do for any NP. So all I have to do in order to show that I can prove something in zero knowledge is define an NP language. Okay? Uh, that's sometimes people get uh, mixed up. They, they uh, think we can prove anything in NP, so anything is just an arbitrary idea. No, define an NP language and then you're fine. So here's an NP language. Uh, it's, a, it's the set of all the values h, so that g to the x equals h. Okay? Uh, you actually have to define it for asymptotically, but, but let's leave that aside. Okay, so I can obviously prove, uh, using the proof from this morning, that indeed H is in this language. But the problem is the same as beforehand. This statement is true for all group elements, because all group elements, because G is a generator, so there exists an X for any group element, so that G to the X equals H. So actually, this is called trivial zero knowledge. In fact, I can prove this statement to you in zero knowledge by sending you the string yes, and you're just checking that H is a group element. And that's a valid zero knowledge proof. It's complete, it's sound, and it's also zero knowledge. Okay? What, but it's also completely meaningless. It's completely meaningless because uh, it doesn't prove anything about the fact that I know X. What we, wanted, what, what, what we want to do is come up with some way of forcing me to actually know the witness in order to prove the proof. Now. You might look at the way that uh, we proved Hamiltonicity, we proved zero knowledge for Hamiltonicity, and say, oh, well, obviously you need to know the witness for that. But I don't know that that's the case. Maybe it's possible, if the statement is in the language, maybe it's possible to come up with some strategy that I can prove that proof without knowing the witness. And as Alon finished in the, in, in the previous talk, if, uh, without proving that formally, I have no guarantee that this cannot be done. And indeed, here is a great example with identity where it's, it's actually true. I can easily prove this statement uh, in zero knowledge without knowing anything about the witness, because it turns out to be a trivial statement. So the first question we have to ask before we try to define what it means for a proof to be a zero knowledge proof of knowledge, or just a proof of knowledge in general, is what knowledge means. Okay, so... Uh, we work in universities, uh, we test knowledge. So we can define knowledge as, well, we say that a student knows something if he or she can output it. Okay? We approximate this output process by asking questions in an exam and getting the students to output the answers. 
And uh, if uh, we wrote a good enough exam, that's a random sample of the material, and the student can output that random sample of the material with high probability, then we assume that the student knows a good majority of the material by using Chernoff bound. Okay? So that's why, uh, that's the way we construct tests in universities. And knowledge is about output. So why do I want to define knowledge by output? Because it's something concrete that I can actually check and look at. Right? Often we think about what does knowing something mean, like an internal fuzzy feeling, that's not something that we can really work with. Uh, but you'll see soon that this obviously, when we go to the, uh, uh, to the world of uh, Turing machines or polynomial time machines, this will be uh, obviously much more concrete. So I want to define that a machine knows something if it can output it. Okay, so if we have an MP relation R uh, and we have a statement X, uh, then we can say that the machine knows the witness to the statement if it can output some W so that XW is in that NP relation. Okay, so if you can output a witness to the statement, then you know that witness. It's pretty obvious, um, but what does it mean for a machine to be able to output it? Well, it seems obvious, but let's just think for a moment. I want to say that we have a machine and it knows a witness. So obviously if the machine, you run the machine and it outputs the witness, then the machine knows the witness. But we're not going to be talking about that. We're going to talk about a machine that does other things. And we want to know if that machine also knows a witness. So if you're thinking about the, Hamil the proof of Hamiltonicity in zero knowledge, we want to try and argue that, oh, we have to send a, a commitment to matrices and you have to know the cycle essentially in order to be able to complete this proof. Uh, so that machine is not outputting a witness, it's doing a lot of other stuff. It's outputting commitments, that it's getting a challenge, and it's opening some commitments in some way or another way, depending on what the challenge is. So that's not a machine who's actually just outputting the witness, because that's sort of obvious. If you output the string, you know the string. So here's the first attempt, uh, and we'll take, it'll take us three or four attempts to actually get there. So the first attempt exactly is to say, okay, so I have a machine M. This machine might be running this zero-knowledge proof for Hamiltonicity or something else. And we'll say that it knows the witness to a statement if there exists a machine M prime who outputs the witness itself. Okay, it's yeah, and it's only the first attempt, so it's a pretty weak attempt, I accept. The problem is there's no, what's the relation between M prime and M? And arguably there's always a machine, there always exists a machine that outputs a, wit a certain witness for a certain statement. So saying that M knows if some M prime can output the string is completely meaningless. There has to be some connection between M and M prime, and it also has to somehow be connected to M's actions, which is proving this proof. So here's a second attempt. We define an oracle machine, K, so a polynomial, uh, probabilistic polynomial time machine, K, which we call a knowledge extractor. And the idea is that if the uh, uh, knowledge extractor can interact with this machine and get the witness, then that means that the machine actually knew the, uh, knew the witness itself. Okay, so we have this knowledge extractor, and we say that M will know the witness if when I, when I give K oracle access to M, which means it can interact with M in any way it wants, send messages, get back responses in an arbitrary manner, then that K will output W. Okay, so now we're connecting between outputting the witness and the machine M itself. Okay, and since, because J K is generic, we now have that knowledge of W by K actually translates to knowledge of W by the machine W. We're still not quite there because it doesn't relate to the machine's actions. Like I, don't, I haven't said anything about what the machine does. And K could still know W independently of M. Okay, so how do we stop this situation where you know, it just happens to be this K knows W on outputs, so it has nothing to do with the way it's interacting with it. Okay, well, we're getting closer. Here's a third attempt. Again, we have the same Oracle machine, polynomial type Oracle machine K, called a knowledge extractor. And now we want to connect what K does to, this, to a prover in some proof. So we have a prover P star. The reason why the prover is P star and not P is because it might be a cheating prover. In the context of a proof of knowledge, this may be a prover who's trying to prove a statement without knowing the witness. So if we think about the, the uh, motivation that we had of uh, proving identity, so I have a public key and I want to prove that I know the private key. So cheating here is not 
like it was uh, earlier today, where cheating is breaking soundness. If I'm a cheating prover, I wanted to prove a false statement. Here, I'm not trying to prove a false statement. What I am trying to do is convince you that I know something when I actually don't. Okay? Now, uh, it might be that I can convince you that I know something when I don't, with some probability. If I did one round of Hamiltonicity, I can prove anything with probably one half. I don't need to know anything, right? I can just try and play the simulator, and with probably one half, I manage to complete the proof. So does that mean that I know anything? It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean but what we can say is that we want this extractor, this knowledge extractor K, to be able to output a witness with approximately the same probability that uh, the prover can convince the verifier. Because there may be some probability that you can just guess, you can just have good luck. And then we say that K, this knowledge extractor, should be able to output a witness with the same probability, or essentially approximately the same probability, as the probability that the prover can convince the verifier. Okay, again, K is generic, this knowledge extractor is generic, and it works for any X and any prover. Now, if this K will work for any X and for any prover, then it can't, can no longer store uh, the, um, you know, just a specific witness and output that, right? Because it's quantified to be able to work over any prover and any statement uh, uh, in, in the language. So that means that it has to be a property of the prover. Because the, 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 the extra, unless it's a trivial language, obviously it's a trivial language, then, uh, you know, if you can find a witness in, uh, in polynomial time by yourself, then that actually means knowledge. So what that actually means is that everybody in this room knows a witness for any uh, MP statement that also for, happens to be in BPP. So everybody knows BPP automatically because you can compute it by yourself. So anything that's polynomial time computable, we don't need anyone to give us that information, we can do it by ourselves. What we're trying to say is that something which is not necessarily polynomial time computable, we can still get that with the same probability that you can prove the statement. So what exactly does it mean that whenever P star convinces V, that's sort of like the last step. We uh, uh, say that just the probability of the success of this extractor is related to the probability, or the same as the probability that, uh, uh, beforehand, that, that, that the verifier is convinced. So this is uh, uh, the final definition. Uh, we're almost there. The only thing that was left that was missing from the, from the definition that I said beforehand is that uh, you can always cheat with negligible probability. And here's a generic way that you can cheat in any zero-knowledge proof. Okay, so assume you have a zero-knowledge proof. In, uh, um, I can always just run the simulator without thinking about anything and just hope for the best that the, prove, that the verifier's queries equal the queries that are output by the simulator. So here's a generic way to cheat in any zero-knowledge proof. Okay, run the simulator, it could even be for an honest verifier, run the simulator, get a transcript, and then you send the first message to the verifier, and the verifier sends a query. If the query from the verifier happens to match what's in the simulator's uh, um, transcript, then I can send the next message, and I get back the query. If it happens to match, I can get the next message, and, and I send the next message. And if everything lines up, then I've managed to cheat, because that simulator, by the properties of a good simulator, will be able to generate a transcript that is convincing if, if, if the statement is in the language. Uh, and actually, if it's a hard language, even if the statement is not in the language, you can prove that as well. So here's a uh, way you can always cheat, but I certainly don't need to know a witness. If the statement is in the language, I certainly don't need to know a witness, I can just run the simulator. The good luck, uh, or the fortunate uh, uh, side of this, is that everything would only match up with very small probability unless the query, unless the amount of uh, uh, the entropy of the, the verified queries is very, very low, uh, you will always be, a, you, you, this will only match up with very, very low probability, with negligible probability, typically. Okay, but we have to somehow m uh, make sure that we work that into the definition of knowledge, because if I say that the knowledge extractor has to output a witness with exactly the same probability that the uh, uh, verifier is convinced, then I'm going to have this problem or I have this negligible difference which is going to cause a problem. So we update it to, an, to allow something we call the knowledge error, which can be negligible and cannot be, can, and thus doesn't have to be negligible. And then we say that if the prover ver convinces the verifier with probability that is greater than this knowledge error, greater than kappa, then our knowledge extractor should be able to output a witness with the approximately the same probability 
that the prover convinces the verifier. Okay, so this is what knowledge essentially means. Okay, you can think of it as an oral exam. We have a student. We want to check that the student knows uh, the material. So we take the student into a locked room and we uh, uh, throw questions at the student at the same time while uh, uh, torturing them. And we see whether or not, because we have to rewind them, which is a type of, like, of stretching. And, and, uh, and we uh, see whether the student can answer our questions. And if they can answer our questions, we're convinced that they know the material. And in fact, we're a knowledge extractor to the extent that after we ask all of these questions, we're able to output the lecture notes of the entire course. Okay? So that will be a proof that the student knows the material. And since we're in university and high school, we actually have new theorems in there that weren't even proven in the lecture, lecture notes to show that they can also go further. So that's what we want to do here. We have a prover who will answer questions about one thing, right? So our prover for in a zero knowledge proof is not going to ever send a witness. We know that the prover will never send an actual witness because then the proof wouldn't be zero knowledge. Uh, so the prover is going to be answering, you know, sending commitments or, or whatever the proof says, uh, but it's not going to ever explicitly send a witness. And now we're going to be able to interact with that prover and somehow magically output our witness. Uh, and this is going to work for any prover, any cheating strategy of the prover, and any statement uh, up to these probabilities, the probability that we have this small probability kappa of the knowledge error that the prover can just somehow be lucky, and, uh, and then we have to be able to succeed otherwise. Okay, is, is that clear to everyone? So this is how we define a form of knowledge. If there any questions, please ask now. No questions. Okay, I hope that means it's clear. And this property we call knowledge soundness. It's not soundness in the sense of what we defined earlier today. It's knowledge soundness. Okay? It's a similar idea. And you can relate the two because clearly I can't output a witness if the statement is false. Right? If I want to try to prove to you uh, um, that I know a witness for a false statement, then I can't because there is no witness by definition for a false statement. Because if the statement is on the language, it has no witness. Therefore, knowledge soundness actually implies soundness, but it also implies much more. And in particular, if I wanted to prove that I know the private key to some public key, if it's possible to verify the public key is, in the, is a valid public key, like in the uh, El Gamal example, then that would be a trivial proof as a zero knowledge, as a standard zero knowledge proof, because all I need to do is verify that uh, this H is in the group. And I'm done. That's in, I don't have to actually have any interactions. This is a trivial zero knowledge proof, but it's certainly not trivial to prove that uh, a zero knowledge proof of knowledge. So knowledge soundness in that case is certainly not trivial, uh, uh, and that's something that we still have to do. Okay. So here's the formal definition. Read it slowly. Uh, a proof system has knowledge soundness uh, with error kappa. If there exists a probabilistic polynomial time. K, machine, uh, uh, knowledge extractor machine K, such that for every proof of P star and every X, Alon promised earlier that you have lots of quantifiers, here they are, every proof, we exist a, a K, so that for every proof of P star and every K, if P star convinces the verifier, the honest verifier of X, whatever that means, but convinces essentially that it knows X, it knows, the, it managed to succeed in, in completing the proof, with probably epsilon that is greater than kappa, then our knowledge extractor will output a W that's a valid statement, a valid witness to the fact that X is in the language, so XW is in the NP relation, with probably at least epsilon minus kappa. Okay, so we allow there to be some sort of uh, a gap as well, so you have to, if you convince greater than this lower bound of kappa, then uh, the knowledge extractor should succeed with epsilon minus kappa. And if you think about kappa being negligible, then what this means is that if you can prove with any reasonable probability, because negligible is the same as non-existence, if you can prove with any reasonable probability, then the knowledge extractor will be able to succeed in uh, extracting with probability that's very close, uh, uh, with very close to the probability of convincing. Okay, so that's the formal definition. Good? All right. It turns out that there's an, a, a, an equivalent formulation that is very useful in uh, when we actually want to use zero knowledge proofs of knowledge, and I'll get to that much later on at the end of the, the session uh, today. Um, uh, the, this, this talk, I'll get to the end of why where, where you want to use this alternative formulation. At the beginning, it looks strange, 
but bear with me for now. Uh, and the motivation behind this alternative formulation is we can often actually trade off success probability with running time. Okay, so if I want to throw a dice and I want the result of that throw to be a six, then I can throw the dice once and succeed with probability one over six, or I can try throwing multiple times until I get a six. And the more times I throw the dice, the higher my probability that I'm going to get a six. Okay, or I can play the lottery and buy one ticket and only lose a little bit of money and my probability is very low, I can buy 100,000 tickets and uh, with a chance of losing a lot more money, but the expectation will be the same and I will have a higher probability of winning. Okay, so the definition says we can run in probabilistic polynomial time and output with the witness with probability epsilon. So what happens if I run this one over epsilon times? Because if, if in each, each attempt I can succeed with probability epsilon, if I run one over epsilon times, then I expect the expectation is that I'll actually succeed. And if I did n over epsilon, where n is a security parameter, then the probability that I would fail will become negligible in n. Okay, so I can just repeat many, many, many times, and actually then have a very high probability of outputting a witness. So this is the alternative uh, formulation, which says exactly this idea, that a proof system has knowledge soundness with error kappa, if there again exists this knowledge extractor k, uh, such, such that for every proof of p star and every x which is missing here, if p star convinces v of x with probably epsilon greater than kappa, so that's exactly the same as beforehand, then now my knowledge extractor with oracle access to p star doesn't run necessarily in polynomial time and output uh, a witness with probability epsilon, rather it, run, it always outputs a witness, so it will always output a witness, but it will run in expected time, which is poly, po, some polynomial divided by epsilon. It's actually divided by epsilon minus kappa, uh, because again, we have this, uh, uh, it's the same thing when we ran in the previous definition, you had epsilon minus kappa. So you just run many, many, many times, and you hope to succeed. Now, what I said is before, and you can run one over epsilon times, and the probability that you'll succeed is going to be, or the expectation you expect to succeed, you can run n over epsilon times, and you'll succeed with probability, which is uh, 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 overwhelming, so except for negligible in n, or you can just run forever. You can just run forever and always keep trying until you succeed. Uh, you can show that such a strategy will uh, have expected time which is polynomial divided by epsilon, or epsilon minus kappa. Okay, because uh, you, because you expect to, to succeed in one over epsilon minus kappa times, then uh, uh, that's your expected polynomial time. And we see that often in zero knowledge, expected polynomial time comes up. So you don't always need it, but there are places where it's, uh, uh, actually there are places where it's actually essential. I don't know if Alon will mention it later on. Uh, but, for example, in the simple case of perfect zero knowledge, uh, you also need expected polynomial time. So often we use expected polynomial time and we, uh, we say that it's, it, that it's good enough. Okay, so the first thing I just want to convince you, I mentioned it very briefly, but I want to say it again, that these definitions are actually equivalent. Why is it important that these definitions are equivalent? Because in, in many, many cases, one of the definitions is easier for proving that a protocol is actually a zero knowledge proof of knowledge. But the other definition is uh, easier to use when I want to when I want to use the zero knowledge uh, proof of knowledge protocol as a sub protocol somewhere else. So we often have this. It's like an encryption. We have a definition of semantic security, which convinces us very much that the encryption scheme is is uh, is secure. But because uh, it's a very appealing definition, but it's horrible to try and prove that encryption schemes actually meet that definition, and that's a similar thing that we have here. The first definition, the original definition, is easier for proving that a protocol is a zero-knowledge proof of knowledge, but we want to use it actually, the second one is more useful, which I'll show you later on. So let's just show that they're equivalent. The, firstly, the original implies the alternative, so we're given an, an extractor that runs in polynomial time and outputs a witness with probably close to epsilon. Okay, epsilon minus uh, kappa, but let's leave that. And as I said before, we can just run the extractor many times until, in fact, in, just run it until a witness is output. So we could have infinite series, but uh, we expect to stop after one over epsilon time. So our overrunning time is polynomial divided by epsilon. Okay, that means that, and, and what's an important thing to note here 
is that how do we know when we got it right? Okay, in general, if I say, okay, so I run this knowledge extractor many times and I wait until I get a witness, how do I know when I got a good witness? Actually, we only know that because it's an NP relation. If I wanted to try and define this over other relations that weren't necessarily NP relations, so I couldn't verify efficiently if I got a correct witness back, then these equivalents wouldn't hold anymore. Or at least I don't know that it holds, and I would conjecture that you can separate them, but I don't know for sure. So, but if, since it's an NP relation, I just run the extractor each time, I get something back. The extractor doesn't necessarily say I failed, it gives me something back. Uh, and then I check whether what I got is a good witness. If yes, I stop. If not, I continue again, and so on and so forth. And as I said, the expected number of times is one over epsilon. What about the alternative implying the original? Now I have a, an extractor that runs in e uh, expected time, which is polynomial divided by epsilon, and I want to somehow convert that into an extractor that runs in expected polynomial time always, but just exceeds with probability epsilon, and that you just do by truncation. Okay, so if uh, I have such a thing, I can just truncate its executions, and if I truncate it in a smart way, then I'll get a success probability that's epsilon. So we're given a k that runs in time approximately 1 over epsilon outputs a witness, then I run uh, for i equals 1 to n, I run k for 2 to the power of i plus 1 steps, and if it finishes it out, it's a witness, and otherwise I proceed with probably one half to the next iteration. And you can show that if you take uh, uh, just setting the i's, the, the, the values correctly, you, you find that you get something will, that will succeed with probably epsilon, and its expected running, polynomial, expected running time is polynomial because each time you only proceed to the next step with probability one half, so you only get uh, uh, these very long two to the, this this execution, which is 2 to the power of n steps long, with probability 2 to the minus n. So overall, in polynomial time, but I get that my uh, success is approximately epsilon. The, uh, I won't go into the details, but, but you can show that. Okay, so we have two definitions. Uh, that's uh, of what knowledge soundness is. And then we get what's a zero-knowledge proof of knowledge, or a zk poc. We just have the three... Uh, properties of any interactive, of, 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 like of zero knowledge, except that we add now knowledge soundness instead of soundness. We have completeness, uh, the honest prover convinces the honest verifier, we have zero knowledge that ensures the verifier learns nothing from this interaction, and we have knowledge soundness that ensures the prover knows the witness. And if we think about the motivation that we said about proving identity, so I have a public key, I want to prove that I know the private key, then obviously we need completeness to make sure that honest parties can authenticate and log in, we need zero knowledge to make sure that I don't leak my private key in this interaction. If I leaked my private key uh, in the proof, then uh, someone would be able to steal my private key and do uh, uh, horrible things. Um, and knowledge soundness is needed for, uh, to prevent someone from successfully proving the proof, even though they actually don't know the private key. In the case of El Gamal, as we saw, that's completely trivial. Okay. I just want to stress that zero knowledge is a property of the prover. What does it mean it's a property of the prover? If we have an honest prover, then, and it runs this protocol, it knows that whatever the verifier does, the verifier can't cheat. So this protects, so zero knowledge is a property that protects the prover against potentially cheating verifiers who want to extract its secrets. And zero, knowledge soundness is, the, uh, is actually a property of the verifier. It protects the verifier against a cheating prover. So if the verifier runs the protocol honestly, then it knows that even if it's up against some cheating prover who's trying to arbitrarily, try, trying to you know, claim that it knows something that it doesn't know, like many students we have, then uh, um, the uh, verifier is going to be protected and that, that such a prover would not be able to successfully prove. Okay? All right. So just like with soundness, we have numerous questions about, okay, what happens if I start with a protocol that has soundness half? Can I get it to a protocol which has negligible soundness? So you have sequential composition, and you can run this n times one after the other, and you get two to the minus n soundness. The same thing is also true of, of uh, knowledge error. Uh, I think it's even worse to prove it here than on regular soundness, so I'm not going to do that. But uh, a sequential composition does reduce the knowledge error exponentially, and the idea is, is a similar idea. If I have a probability of one half 
of extracting in every ex execution, and I have n executions, then the probability that I fail to extract in all of them is going to be negligible. Okay, because I just have to succeed in one of them according to the definition. Another interesting thing, though, that happens here that does not happen at all in, uh, in regular zero knowledge is that if I have an exponentially small error, I can actually reduce that to a zero error. Okay, so if I have knowledge soundness that's exponentially small, not negligible, by exponentially small I mean really like 2 to the minus n, it doesn't work if it's just some negligible function, or if it's n to the minus log n. So if I have exponentially small soundness error, then I can actually replace that with complete zero error. And you can't do that in the zero knowledge proofs. And the reason is, uh, and here we're going to use the alternative formulation in order to show this. So here's the idea. Assume that we have some knowledge error that's exponentially small. So it's 2 to the minus n, where n is the length of the statement. OK, and we're thinking the, the, the alternative definition where the, uh, if the prover convinces with probability greater than kappa, then um, we have an uh, extractor that will succeed with probability polynomial divided by, by that epsilon. So now what we do is we run the knowledge extractor in parallel to a brute force search on the witness. Okay, so we assume that the witness is, uh, I mean, we have to play a bit here, but assume the witness is also of length, same length as the statement. So there are two to the n possible witnesses. I can just, while I'm running the knowledge extractor, I can try, in parallel, I try each witness and verify if it's correct. So I just increment, take a string n bits long, try all possible strings, and I stop when the first of these two processes stop. So either the knowledge extractor succeeds, or my brute force uh, search of the witness succeeds. And now I have to argue that this is actually a valid knowledge extractor. This looks like a very, very strange thing to do, but here's, uh, here's why it works. So I'm going to assume for this that the brute force search will take times 2 to the n, where n is the length of the statement, and let p star be some prover that convinces v of the statement with probability epsilon. Okay, that, that's what I know. I don't know what epsilon is. Epsilon can be very, can be large, or it can be very, 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 very small. So I look at two different cases. I want to ask first if epsilon is greater than 2 kappa. If epsilon is greater than 2 kappa, we know that the original knowledge extractor, by the uh, alternative definition, will succeed, will always output a witness in time that's polynomial divided by epsilon minus kappa. Okay? Now, epsilon minus kappa, if epsilon is greater than 2 kappa, epsilon minus kappa is, is uh, uh, greater than kappa. Okay, so that, sorry, it's greater than epsilon. So that means that the, the running time of this extractor is less than polynomial divided by epsilon. Okay, so it succeeds in time polynomial divided by epsilon, which means that in terms of the alternative formulation, the kappa disappeared from this equation. Right, that's what it means that, that there's zero knowledge error, that kappa is equal to zero. Okay, so if epsilon is greater than 2 kappa, the original kappa, then we have the success. And if epsilon is less than 2 kappa, then running in time polynomial divided by epsilon is actually greater than 2 to the power of n. So I have enough time to finish my brute force search. Okay, so what this means, in other words, is that if the probability that the prover convinces the verifier is high, right, higher than the knowledge error, then the knowledge extractor will finish. And if the probability is lower, then the brute force search uh, uh, will finish. And in both cases, I get an equation which is polynomial, po running time which is polynomial divided by epsilon, expected polynomial time which is, polynomial, which is some polynomial divided by epsilon, and that means that I have zero knowledge error. Okay, does that make sense to everyone? You try these two cases, you don't know where the prover succeeds uh, the problem is, in general, you don't know where the pr what probability the prover successfully proves in, so you just run in parallel, and if it happens to be a high probability, the first process will finish. If it's a small probability, the second process will finish, but in both cases, you get the right running time and, and the right success. Okay, so now we want to construct zero-knowledge proofs of knowledge. Okay, so we saw, we know how to define them, we know what it means to know something, Knowledge is uh, expression. Okay, knowledge is being able to output it. Uh, we've talked about how to define it by some oracle machine. 
And now we want to look at things that you already saw this morning. I don't want to make up any new protocols. Uh, I'm just going to take protocols that you already saw from Alon this morning. I don't want you to misunderstand. It's not true that every zero-knowledge proof is a proof of knowledge. We have, of course, uh, stupid examples to show where it's not, okay? Uh, exactly like the example with the public key of an Elgama public key. That's an example which is clearly a zero, it's a trivial zero knowledge proof and it's certainly not a proof of knowledge. Just saying yes, saying yes is not a proof of knowledge. That's easy. But there are also natural examples uh, like, for example, some constant round zero knowledge proofs that uh, we do not believe are, are proofs of knowledge. Do not believe me, we have no idea how to construct an extractor. We conjecture they don't exist. I don't know that we have a proof, though, that it's not possible. I don't know. So here's the proof that you saw for quadratic residuosity. We have some x, which is a quadratic residue. And the prover wants to uh, prove that x is indeed a quadratic residue. So the prover chooses a random r, sends y, which is r squared. The verifier sends a bit b. And the prover either opens r or opens r times w. And the verifier will check either that z squared equals y or z squared equals x times y. Okay, now we, uh, uh, the idea behind soundness is what uh, Alon said this morning, that if, y, if x is not a quadratic residue, then w times r, or there would be no value, no way to answer the query one. When b equals 1, if you, if you, if you sent a quadratic residue, uh, if you sent y to be a quadratic residue, you can answer b equals 0, but not b equals 1. And if you sent y to be a non-quadratic residue, then you cannot answer b equals 0. So you are, as a prover, you have to try and hope that you're going to be able to cheat by guessing one of these two uh, ways of sending y. But if you're wrong in one of them, then, then if you're wrong about what the query was, then you won't be able to answer because there is no valid answer. Okay, that's not an argument that we can use because it might very well be that x is a quadratic residue, but I have no idea of its square root. And if I don't know the square root, then I, can't, then I should not be able to prove this proof. Okay, we want that it's, oh, it should only be possible to prove this proof if I actually know this value w, okay, this w over here. But who says that I know it? Maybe it's just a true statement. And that's what we have to prove now. So here's the idea of a knowledge extraction, and I put the protocol on the top right of the slide so you can follow what the protocol is in parallel to look at the idea of knowledge extraction. And just like with simulation, knowledge extraction is going to require some additional power of the extractor, which is in particular rewinding. And why is it absolutely essential? Because if it's possible to extract the witness um, just by regular interaction, then a cheating verifier could also, would also be able to extract the witness in a regular proof. And that means it would not be zero knowledge. So in a regular proof where you just interact in a regular way with the, with the prover, you're unable to extract the witness because that's guaranteed by zero knowledge. So how is it possible now to extract? Well, we have to have some additional power. Like a simulator has additional power, the knowledge, knowledge extractor has additional power, and that power here, it doesn't, it doesn't always have to be, but that power here is going to be rewinding. Okay, so let's see why rewinding helps. So we have k, which is our knowledge extractor, and it invokes p star, and it receives some value y. Okay? Um, by the way, uh, I didn't mention that there are some other subtle details in the definition. Uh, are we talking about a deterministic prover or a probabilistic prover? I'm using the definition where the prover is a deterministic machine, so it has its x and its w and its randomness all hardwired inside. We just, we just don't know what it is. We don't have any access to it. We, we only interact with it externally. Uh, it's equivalent for most cases. So uh, K, the extractor invokes the cheating prover and receives back some y. And then what the uh, extractor does is it sends, uh, it sends in uh, quotation marks, it's not really sending, it's interacting with its oracle machine, but it, it, it invokes p star with a query zero after getting y, and it gets back some z zero, and then it rewinds the prover and sends it the query one and receives back z one. Okay? I don't, don't think Alon mentioned in this slide, but uh, rewinding maybe once used to be hard to explain, but now there are virtual machines you can take a snapshot of, and reverse them back, and that's exactly where rewinding is. Okay, so we're taking a snapshot of the machine and putting it back to a previous point in its execution and running it from there on. 
Okay, so we sent it zero, we sent it one, we got back z zero and z one, and we want to see can this somehow help us to learn the witness. It's unclear why that should be possible. But what I claim is that the inverse, the, the extractor would just output z one divided by z zero, and this should be the square root of x. This should actually be the witness. Why is that the case? So uh, let's look at the proof that this is actually a valid knowledge extraction. So if p star convinces with probability that's greater than one half, okay, then what you what I'm doing here is because I'm assuming a deterministic prover, and there's, that means there's only one bit essentially of uh, randomness here, then either it convinces with probability one half, zero, a half, or one. There's, uh, is everything okay? Yeah. So it either convinces probability zero, a half, or one because it's a deterministic prover, and there's only one bit of randomness in the entire execution. Okay? So, if the prover convinces the probability greater than one half, then it means it answers both queries. And if it answers both queries, then it means that z0 squared equals y, and z1 squared equals x times y. So when you, def when you divide uh, z1 by z0, you will get uh, you'll get the square, you'll get, oh, sorry, one second. If you then, then when you divide, that means that w squared is z1 divided by z0 squared, and therefore uh, z1 divided by z0 is actually the witness itself, the square root of x. Okay, is that clear? Now again, why is this possible? Because in the real execution, the verifier will only ever get one of these answers. Okay, that's what Alon talked about earlier today, that uh, the verifier will either only see, ever see R or R times W. If it sees R, certainly nothing is revealed about, about W. And if it's R times W, it's also nothing is revealed about W because R masks it, like a one-time pad. So nothing is revealed about W in a real execution, but now the extractor is able to ask for both queries to get both answers relative to the same Y, and that's a crucial point. Why is this different to sequential composition? In sequential composition, when you run this proof many times, in each execution, you're choosing a new Y. If you don't choose a new Y, then the protocol is completely broken for exactly this reason. But if you choose a new Y each time, then you're safe, therefore you have zero knowledge. But here, we're actually getting both answers to the same Y, and, that's, uh, uh, and that enables you to actually get the witness and, and, the, and therefore, you cannot prove this statement without knowing the witness. Again, why, you, why does it mean you cannot prove this without knowing the witness? Because if you can answer both queries, then that means that uh, uh, we can actually use you to extract the witness itself. So this is a proof with knowledge error one half, because of course you can always successfully uh, cheat with probability one half by running the simulator strategy. Okay, but if uh, um, you, if you can prove, if you can succeed, succeed in proving probably you're greater than one half, then it must be that you know the witness. And then again, using sequential composition, you can run this many times, uh, uh, one after the other, to get the uh, uh, to get negligible knowledge error. Okay. What about Hamiltonicity? So that was for a very specific language of quadratic residuosity. What happens if I want to prove Hamiltonicity? So I want to now prove that a zero knowledge proof of knowledge for any statement in NP. So we have, uh, uh, we can reduce our NP statement to Hamiltonicity. And now uh, we have a graph, and, I, and what I want to prove is that I actually know a Hamiltonian cycle in this, in this graph. So the proof is the same as before. The uh, uh, prover sends a commitment to the adjacency matrix of, or permutation, a random permutation of the adjacency matrix of the graph. The verifier sends a bit, uh, and based on whether the bit is 0 or 1, the prover either opens only a cycle, or it opens the entire graph and gives the, gives the permutation, and the verifier can check this is indeed a permutation of the correct graph. And this is zero knowledge, because of what we mentioned beforehand, that you can guess, if you can guess the bit ahead of time, you can either send garbage commitments except for a single cycle, or you can just send uh, a permutation of the graph without knowing a cycle at all. And then you just hope you're right with your guess, and if not, you try again until you guess correctly the bit B, and now you have an convincing transcript. Okay, so why, uh, but in a real execution, you don't have this chance of try, trying more than once, so 
you're going to be caught with probability one half. So the reason this is a zero knowledge proof of knowledge is exactly the same as the quadratic residuosity example. Okay, so so uh, uh, K will invoke our prover and receive a commitment, and then the, the, the extractor will send both a query to zero and a query to one. Okay, and when it sends a query to zero, it gets, a, gets back a, a cycle in the graph, and when it sends a query to one, it gets the permutation and, uh, uh, and the graph that's uh, isomorphic to the original graph by that permutation. Uh, once it does that, it can extract the cycle by simply applying the permut inverse permutation to the cycle, and that should be a Hamiltonian cycle in the original graph if both of these are correct. Okay? And, that's the, uh, uh, and, and that's exactly the same reason we had beforehand. So if the prover convinces the verifier the probability greater than one half, then W is into a cycle in, uh, in the permutation of the graph, and that means that the inverse is a so cycle in G, and it can, it's able to obtain that cycle. Okay, so these are relatively easy examples because they, uh, um, they work on a sing only a single bit of uh, a query, and then you have a very simple probabilistic analysis. But I warn you that actually proving that something's a proof of knowledge is uh, uh, between tricky and extremely annoying. It's m actually much more difficult than proving soundness typically when you have uh, especially if you're looking at constant round protocols, you, you have arbitrary probabilities and you have to see that you can actually extract with a probability that is, you know, the prover could, could suc successfully prove with any arbitrary probability and, and you have to somehow manage to actually uh, extract with the right probability. For that reason, uh, when Benny will talk about sigma protocols, sigma protocols happen to be constant round protocols that can be used to get proofs of knowledge that have a very nice property that enables extraction very easily, but in the generic case, uh, expect to work very hard. That's all I can say. Not that I want to turn you off or anything, but uh, that's the reality. Okay, so um, what happens though if I do want to get negligible error, and I want to show you uh, a, an argument for getting negligible error for, for a Hamiltonicity, uh, but via sequential composition. You could argue that it's not necessary because I already told you that that sequential composition reduces the error, but I didn't prove that so I can prove it to you directly. And what I'll actually show you is that Hamiltonicity gives you something which is much stronger than a standard zero knowledge proof of knowledge. Okay, so the proof I'm looking at is running Hamiltonicity uh, n times sequentially. In each time, uh, there's a probably one half that uh, or, or each, each one is a proof of knowledge of probability one half. We saw that with knowledge error one half. We want to argue that overall then this should be a, a, a proof of knowledge with knowledge error two to the minus n, but let's see how that plays out. Okay, so what I have on the right hand side of the slide here is a, a binary tree which traces the way such an execution looks. And you should think about this as an execution tree. So at the node, is the first uh, proof that's being run. And in that proof, the verifier can choose its query to be either zero or one. And if its query was zero, then you traverse the left side of that tree, and the second node is the second proof that's being run. And there also the proof, the verifier will ask either zero or one, and you can, so if the proof, if, if this is three sequential executions, and if the verifier, uh, verifier's queries were zero, one, one, then you're looking at this path here, and if it was 1, 0, 0, then it would be like this path here. Okay, so you, you, can, you can map the execution to a different path in this tree. Now here's an ex the extractor strategy. So we have this binary tree of the execution, and the extractor tries to extract in the ith execution. How does it extract in the ith execution? It gives, a, it gives the uh, prover a zero query and a one query. Remember when rewinding, we can rewind to any point that we like. So we don't have to rewind all the way back to the beginning, but in the ith execution, you just rewind within that execution, which means you got the commitments from the prover. You give it a zero and you give it a one, and you see where the prover answers zero, one, or two of the queries. Okay, the prover only has three possibilities. At every single point, in every execution, where there's only a single query from the verifier, there are only three possibilities. Either the prover answered zero, one, or two of the queries. So if the uh, prover answers both queries, 
then uh, uh, you got, we got a Hamiltonian cycle. Okay, so if the prover answered both of the queries, then we got a Hamiltonian cycle. If the prover answers near, near the query, then the ver verifier rejects on, on this path. Okay, so if the, ver if the prover, um, it's not always rejects, it rejects on this path. Yeah, so if the prover answers near the query, then the verifier rejects on this path, so you should erase the word always there. Um, and if the, the prover answers exactly one query, then I argue that then what the extractor will do will go down that edge. Okay, let's think about it in this way. We start at the root node, which is the first execution, and we try to, uh, we send a, query, a zero and one query. If we got answers to both, wonderful, we're done. If we got answers to none, then in this case, actually, the verifier always does reject because we're at the root query. And if we got answers only to b equals zero, then we'll actually go down the left path. What does it mean to go down the left path? It means that in our uh, rewinding strategy, we give again zero and then proceed in that path. Or in your virtual machine snapshot, whichever you're more comfortable with, you uh, run the virtual machine on, on that path which, on which you'd given b equals zero. And then you, could, then you iterate over this the whole way uh, the whole way down. And you repeat this all the way through. And now, note that the only way that extraction will fail in, in, this, uh, in, in this strategy is if the prover exa answers exactly one query in each execution. Okay? So in particular, we start at the root node, and if the prover answers none of those queries, then the, prover re then the verifier will reject, always. And if the prover answers, and if the prover answers only one of the queries, the z query, we, we go left. And now we're again at a node, and we run the prover, and we, uh, um, we check how many queries it answers. If the, if the prover answers none of the queries, then I argue that verif the verifier will always reject. Why will the verifier always reject, and not only with probability one half here? Anyone see that? I claim that even at this point, the verifier will always reject if both queries are not answered. Hmm? No, no, no winning. Why is no winning? What happened on the right edge that we didn't go on? Right, the prover rejected, right? So the prover didn't successfully convince us on B equals one. And now on b equals zero, at the two edges below here, it also, uh, it also rejected. So both of these, it, re it sends invalid, state, invalid answers. And here it also sends invalid state, in an invalid answer. So whatever, whatever the verifier would ask, there will always be invalid answers, and the verifier will always reject. Again, if the prover answers both of them when we got the witness, and if the prover answered one, then we go either left or right. And what we have is that, Either the verifier is never convinced, right? Because we have either zero, you know, in each, in each uh, node there's only one that answers, but then we have on the path of ones, only single path of ones, but it, that gets to a node when, when both are blocked. That's one possibility. Or there happens to be a node where both of the queries are answered, and what happens then? The prover succeeds in, the extractor succeeds in getting the witness. And the third case, which is the only bad case for the extractor, is there happens to be a single path of ones throughout the entire tree. Okay, so at every, on every level, there's one, there, there's, on, on that path of ones, there's only a single path where the verifier be, can, be, can be convinced. So what's the probability of the verifier being convinced by such a prover? If we run n executions? 2 to the minus n. Because in each, at each execution, there's only probability one half that the prover will convince the verifier. Okay, so this extractor then works. It has knowledge error two to the minus n, and it extracts uh, and, and it extracts a witness. Okay, so as long as the prover, or another way of looking at it is, if the if the prover succeeds with probability greater than two to the minus n, then there must be a node where it answers both of the of both of the children answers both of the queries. And if there's a node where it answers both of the queries, where above there are ones, then the extractor will find that node efficiently and will be able to extract the, extract the witness. So what we actually have, though, if you notice, is something much stronger 
than, we, than is required by the definition. Because the definition says that if the prover succeeds with some epsilon greater than 2 to the minus n, then the extractor should be able to get a witness with what probability? It's not a trick question. What did the definition say? If the prover succeeds with probability epsilon greater than 2 to the minus n, then what's the probability the extractor should get a witness? No, that's not what the definition says. Epsilon minus 2 to the minus n. That's what the definition says. But what, what, what's the probability this extractor succeeds? Who said that beforehand? Someone said one before. Say it again. One. one. Very good. OK, in this, uh, in, in this extractor here, if the prover succeeds in proving probability 2 to the minus n, then the extractor always succeeds. Not only that, what is the running time of this extractor? I don't mean by n squared times log n, don't worry. What, what's the running time? What class of machine is it? Polynomial time or expected polynomial time? Polynomial time. In each, at each execution, it tries two queries and sees if it succeeds and goes to the next one. It's a strict polynomial time machine. Okay, and it has a very strong knowledge extraction property that if you succeed probably greater than 2 to the minus n, you always get the witness. This is actually called a strong proof of knowledge. So this is a stronger property than is guaranteed by most proofs of knowledge. And we can define it as follows. A proof system has strong knowledge soundness. If there exists an actual function, mu, and a polynomial time, a strict polynomial time extractor, okay, not an expected one now, such that for every proof of p star and every x, if p star convinces v of x is probably greater than mu, then the extractor will get a witness with probability at least 1 minus mu. So it's not with the same probability of convincing, but almost probability 1. And the Hamiltonicity is a strong proof of sequential Hamiltonicity n times is a strong proof of knowledge with strong knowledge soundness error of 2 to the minus n. So what's nice about this? What's nice about this is it's strict polynomial time. And when you want to use expected polynomial time in other protocols, sometimes things become messy and, 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 and not nice. What's the bad news about this? The bad news about this is that it is, uh, has many rounds, it's sequential only. And in fact, you can show that it's not possible to construct constant round strong proofs of knowledge. OK, under certain reasonable assumptions, it's even, unlike almost everything else we know, it's even true under non-black box, for non-black box zero knowledge. So you cannot, actually cannot construct a, a strong proof of knowledge that's constant round, so it's always going to be expensive in terms of the round complexity. But if you're looking at feasibility results, it's very, very nice. It, it, it's much easier to work with. OK, so that's about the constructions. Uh, now let's talk about uh, a little bit about applications or using zero knowledge proofs of knowledge. So firstly, we have this very strange alternative definition. I didn't say why it's strange, so I'm going to ask you now. This is what the definition says. What about this definition? You should be scratching your head when you look at this definition. Something shouldn't make much sense to you. The longer it takes to answer, the longer you have to wait for lunch. What's wrong with this definition? Hint. What's the running time of this extractor? Hmm? It's expected, but we have to live in most cases, apart from the strong proof of knowledge, we have to live with expected time, sort of part of life. What's, what's the running time of this extractor, apart from that? It could be exponential, no, but there's no guarantee whatsoever it's a polynomial time machine. And in principle, everything breaks once you are in non-polynomial time. Especially we're talking about Hamiltonicity, and we're using commitments, and suddenly I have this machine that's involved, which is exponential time, which may be exponential time. In fact, I have no idea what the writing time of this machine is, because it depends on the, pro on the probability that the prover convinces the verifier. It's poly time polynomial divided by epsilon. Epsilon may be a half, it may be 1 over n, 
It might be one over n to the log n. I have no idea. So I'm running this machine with this prover, and maybe I'm lucky and it's going to finish in reasonable time. And maybe I'm unlucky and it's not going to finish in reasonable time, but I have no idea. And when am I running this? I'm going to be running this extractor when I'm essentially when I'm using a zero knowledge proof of knowledge inside another protocol, and I need to somehow extract in order to prove something. Okay, so for example, I want to I'm using a proof of identity inside some other protocol. I don't want to be able to extract in order to show that uh, everything's okay, but I'm running a machine that may not be polynomial time. Uh, for example, you know, signatures are based on proofs of knowledge in some sense, and uh, you're now going to be, you, you want to run this extractor to prove that the, uh, an, an attacker could no way, an adversary could no, could no way know, uh, prove this proof or, or generate this signature because it doesn't know the discrete log. But now I'm running something that may not even be polynomial time, and I can always break the discrete log if I'm not running in polynomial time. So th th this just makes no sense whatsoever. Okay. You know, what does it help to write in time poly divided by epsilon when this may not be polynomial time? So in order to understand why we have this alternative definition and why it's useful, we have to look at again when we're using, when we're using these things. So the zero knowledge proof of knowledge has many places we want to use it, but when are we using the knowledge extractor? The knowledge extractor comes in in the proof of security, in the same way the simulator comes in in the proof of security. So within a protocol, the prover proves a proof. And in order to prove the security of this protocol, we have some reduction which requires us to extract a witness. Okay, that's the way often these things work. And uh, the, si the simulator of this bigger protocol will run the knowledge extractor of the proof of knowledge. And, and uh, what's important to note is that the simulator or the reduction will need to extract the witness, as, but only as long as the verifier accepts. Because if in a real protocol execution the verifier would reject, then anyway we're allowed to halt and nothing, nothing bad happens. So that's the way we often use these things. Same thing if you're using zero knowledge inside a larger protocol. You'll, uh, your, your simulator will uh, uh, um, you know, sort of check that the verifier would be convinced, and if yes, uh, fine, and then it has to continue the simulation, and if not, then it just stops because uh, anyway uh, it's allowed to stop. Okay, so. Again, the verifier rejects the simulator halts because that would happen in a, real, in a real proof, in a real protocol. And if it accepts, then the simulator has to extract the witness. So that's the two cases we have. Okay, verify, halt, if, 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 if it's a reject, then you halt. And if it's accept, then you need to extract. That if, that if that I wrote in this sentence is what saves us. Because now let's look at what the expected running time of this uh, simulation, simulation strategy or, or reduction is. The probability that the prover convinces the verifier is epsilon. I don't know what epsilon is. Let's be very clear. I have no idea what epsilon is. Epsilon can be a constant. It could be 1 over n or n squared. It also could be 1 over n to the log n. So it could be negligible. It could be noticeable. It could be constant. And by the way, in case you don't know, there are functions that are neither negligible nor noticeable. It could be 1 over n squared for all even n's and 1 over n to the log n for all odd n's, just to make things really annoying. Okay? So I have this, uh, uh, probably the proof of convinces the verify. I have no idea what it is. But I'm at the reduction is verifying the proof, so it's playing the honest verifier. And with probably epsilon, it's going to actually be convinced. Probably 1 over epsilon, it's not going to be convinced, it's going to halt the simulation. When it is convinced, it has to extract. And let's just for a moment now assume the knowledge error is zero. Okay, then what's the expected running time of this simulator? So, or reduction. It's one minus epsilon times polynomial. One minus epsilon is the probability that the, that the verifier is not convinced. And if it's not convinced, we just stop. So it's polynomial and we can stop. And then we add epsilon times the extraction time, which is poly polynomial divided by epsilon. This second thing here may not be polynomial, but actually the expected time of the machine is epsilon times polynomial divided by epsilon. So the epsilons cancel out, and we get something that's expected polynomial time. What this means is the running time of the reduction can be explained more simply as follows. If the prover convinces the verifier with high probability, then, then everything is fine, because with high probability. 
If it convinces the, the verifier with low probability, then I may actually have to run the extractor for a very long time. But I only get to that situation with low probability itself. So the long running time only happens with low probability, and everything fits in nicely to actually give me something which is expected polynomial time overall, and so we're all happy. Okay, we need to know expected polynomial time can have very long uh, executions, but they only happen with low probability. And this also shows why, when you're using these things, expected polynomial time is, uh, is somewhat needed. Okay? Now, I just want to stress that when the knowledge error is, uh, is, is negligible, then we get this equation, so it's 1, of epsilon, 1 minus epsilon times polynomials before, plus epsilon times poly divided by epsilon minus kappa. That is poly plus epsilon divided by epsilon minus kappa, and I just want to stress that this actually may not be polynomial. But I won't say too much because Alon is going to talk about that this afternoon. And he'll explain, right, he'll explain why that's not necessarily polynomial. So you'll find out after lunch that that actually may not be polynomial. The good news is it can be fixed. And what Alon will tell you about after lunch about how to fix that is the same thing that you use here as well. OK, so, um, so that's the first thing I want to mention about the alternative, alternative definition. It's a strange definition when looked at by itself, but when you actually want to use the protocol, a zero knowledge, proof of knowledge protocol in a larger protocol, that's actually the way you will work typically anyway. Okay? Uh, now, if taking that a step further, what that actually means is that when you use such a zero knowledge protocol inside something else, you need to do two things. You need to simulate the view, and extract a witness. Okay, the way I said is you simulate, you, you just you simulate the view of the verifier by of the, verif the view of the prover by running the honest verifier, and if you succeeded, then you'll extract. But it's possible to actually define these together as something called a witness extended emulation. And an ex witness extended emulator is just something that does all of this together. Okay, so it outputs straight away a view of, a, uh, uh, of the prover what, that it would see in a real execution. And as long as, if that's an accepting view, then it will also output a witness. Okay, so it will give you both of those things at once. And if you have such a definition, then it just simplifies your proof of security. Just not using zero knowledge proof of knowledge inside proof of security is non-trivial, so this actually just makes life much easier. If you actually have to do it, I uh, recommend just taking this definition. Um, and, and the reason why it's, uh, why it's okay to take this is because if a proof is a zero knowledge proof of knowledge, then it means that there exists this witness extended emulator. So we'll generate both a view of the prover in a real protocol together with the witness as long as the pr that, that view is an accepting uh, view. Another way you can do it if you're a multi-party computation type person is you can define an ideal zero knowledge functionality. Uh, and for those of you not familiar with MPC, I'll just say that uh, in, this, in this type of model, we can think that there's some external party who actually helps us in our execution, a trusted party, and that trusted party we send our inputs to and get back the outputs, and then we can use a real protocol instead of that trusted party. So the trusted party for, for this case would get from the prover the statement and the witness, would verify that they're correct, and then would just tell the verifier here that's actually, uh, yeah, the prover sent me something which is a valid witness. Uh, and again, you can prove that if a, if a zero knowledge proof of knowledge, if a protocol is a zero knowledge proof of knowledge, then it securely computes this ideal functionality. So the, I'm just showing you this just briefly just to say that if you actually have to use zero knowledge proof of knowledge, then um, when you come to do your proof of security, you'll have a, an easier life either by using a witness extended emulation definition or, a zero, or an ideal zero knowledge functionality, rather than the original definition, because things get tricky when you actually have to uh, prove the simulation. As a standalone box, it's fine by itself, but inside other protocols, it gets messy. OK, so what are some applications for zero knowledge proofs of knowledge? Of course, there's the uh, straightforward ones, but here I'm going to look at four different uh, applications that we can use this for. So Alon again showed this proof. He showed is uh, he showed uh, a proof for non-quadratic residuosity, and he explained that this is actually not a zero-knowledge proof. So I'm going to use zero-knowledge proofs of knowledge in order to turn this proof into a zero-knowledge proof. 
Now, why, why is this original protocol that Alon showed you not a zero-knowledge proof? He explained why, so it's just a matter of memory now. Alon's getting really annoyed now. He thinks no one listened to his whole lecture. Come on. Why is it not a zero-knowledge proof? No, I'm not talking about knowledge. I'm talking about why isn't it zero knowledge? Why the knowledge of their knowledge? Oh, I need to rewind the audience. Okay, so don't come up. We'll do rewinding. <laughs> exactly, perfect. You see that we're listening. So uh, the verifier sends some value Z, and the protocol says take a, a random Y and send either Y squared or X times Y squared. But nothing forces the verifier to do that. The verifier can uh, have some Z which it got from auxiliary input somewhere and just wants to know whether or not Z is, is a uh, quadratic residue. And so it sends that Z that it got externally and it learns from the protocol whether or not Z is a quadratic residue. Okay, that's why it's not zero knowledge. Intuitively, how could you make this zero knowledge? When, when would I know that it's zero knowledge? Yeah, but okay, that's already the, the, the form of formality. But what would we want to verify? What, what property we want from the verifier that would ensure that this would actually be zero knowledge? That it generated, that it knows why, that it generated Z in a correct way. Right. If we knew that the verifier generated Z by choosing a random Y and computing either Z equals Y squared or Y squared times X, then we'd actually be fine and we know this is zero knowledge because the, Z, because the verifier has do, done what it's told to do. Okay? And note that we don't want the verifier to prove the existence of a statement. We want it to prove that it actually knows uh, a Y. Although you'll see why that, that's maybe a bit tricky in a second. Okay, so why? So the proof isn't zero knowledge, as we said, because uh, we don't know how Z is generated. If the verifier sends Z instead and proves that it knows a Y, so that Z equals X Y or Z equals X Y squared, then I claim this is zero knowledge. And uh, and why is this the case? The reason is that um, we want the verifier to prove that that for every that there exists a Y. So that z equals x, y, or z equals x, y squared. But that statement is always true. For every z, there exists a y so that z equals x, y, or z equals x, y squared. So this actually uh, gives us no information. It doesn't help us at all. Again, it's this trivial statement that means nothing. In order to make it meaningful, we actually want to make sure that that y is an explicit object and that's done by a proof of knowledge. And that's actually a general statement that I want to make. Proofs of knowledge enable you to take implicit statements and, ex and convert them into explicit knowledge. So it's not just an implicit statement that something is correct, but now this is explicit knowledge that, that's, that that witness is actually known. Formally, the simulation strategy for this protocol will now be as follows. The simulator will run V star and get some Z. And the simulator wants to complete the proof like beforehand, but just doesn't know whether it should be sending b equals 0, b equals 1. Because the simulator doesn't know wh whether the verifier, uh, how the verifier generated this value, value z. But what the simulator can do is it can run the knowledge extractor on the proof that v star carries out, because we said that we're changing the protocol so that the verifier will send z and prove that it knows why either so that z equals x, uh, x, y squared or z equals y squared. So we run the knowledge extractor and we actually get back y. And when I get y, I can now check, is z, does z equal x, y squared or z equal y squared? That's a typo here, not x, y. It's either z equals x, y squared or y squared. And once it checks that, it can know whether to answer 0 or 1 because it knows exactly what the, how it was generated so it can behave like an honest prover. Okay? So that's the way we can use zero knowledge proofs of knowledge in order to transform, transform an interactive proof that is not zero knowledge in the general sense, but only, for example, for an honest verifier, and we can now make it zero, full zero knowledge even against a malicious verifier. 
And Alon, this afternoon, will generalize this concept into something more generic and show how you can use it in a more general sense to get zero knowledge from weaker primitives. Another application is non-oblivious encryption. If I give you a ciphertext, one, one issue that may arise is that you have no idea if I know what I've encrypted. Now, it may not be important, but in some cases it may be important. And in particular, maybe I've copied this ciphertext from someone else. Okay, so there's an auction uh, going on here, and we all want to bid, um, we all want to bid uh, on uh, some uh, uh, Ferrari, which is outside. And um, I don't want to pay more than I have to, and it's a bad auction, so it's, you have to pay for whatever you bid. It's a top price auction or a second price auction. So what I do is I'm pretty sure, though, that Alon is going to bid the highest bid for that Ferrari in, in the room here, uh, because he really likes Ferraris. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to take his ciphertext and copy it. So I have an equal bid. I'll even take the ciphertext and I'll add one to it. It's a, it's a, it's a type of encryption that you can actually uh, mold, you can add values to, and, and some encryption schemes have that property. The way to prevent that attack would be for me to actually prove that I know what's encrypted in the ciphertext. Because if I know what's encrypted in the ciphertext, I couldn't have copied it from anybody else. Okay, so that's another, it's called non-oblivious encryption because we're, uh, we're, we're convinced that the person who provided the ciphertext actually know what they encrypted. Another uh, uh, application is, what ha is something that occurs whenever we use statistically hiding commitments. So we, there are two types of commitment schemes. There are perfectly binding commitment schemes and perfectly hiding commitment schemes. Perfectly binding commitment schemes have the property that the commitment string itself is, uh, um, fully determines the, the committed value. Okay? And what's, uh, um, com it's computationally hiding means that you, uh, a, a polynomial time bounded uh, receiver can't learn what's inside the commitment. But there's another type of commitment called statistically hiding, and a statistically hiding commitment the hiding property is perfect or, or statistically close. So even if the receiver is all-powerful, it can't learn what's inside the commitment. But that's only possible when the binding property is no longer uh, perfect, it's now computational. So a, an all-powerful uh, committer could actually cheat and open in two different ways. This actually means, when you look at it closer, it means that the commitment string itself actually doesn't define at all what the value was committed to. And if you think about perfectly hiding commitments, every possible string could be, a, a given commitment string could be a commitment to every possible value. Because that's what it means, that an all-powerful receiver can't learn anything. All this string defines actually all possible commitment values. So now if I'm going to commit to something, and we want to know that you know what that commitment value is, obviously we need zero knowledge proof of knowledge. But I want to go, a diff I want to go uh, uh, stronger, let's uh, make a stronger statement. Let's say I'm committing to some string which is my identity, and I'm using a statistically hiding commitment because it gives me protection forever. Okay? And I want to prove that a certain value in that string is in a range. So this is my identity, and I want to prove that my age is between uh, uh, 40 and 50, okay? Because I want to go to a club that only takes people between 40 and 50. It's a very interesting club. People, people sit there and comp complain that their backs hurt, okay? <laughs> so that's the club that I want to go to. And I, I'm proving that my value, value in this commitment is in that range. But if the commitment string, if the commitment string defines every possible value, then this is once again a trivial statement. In fact, there always exists committed values that are in that range. So it's completely meaningless to prove a zero-knowledge proof. If I prove to you a standard zero-knowledge proof that there, this commitment value defines an identity with an age between 40 and 50, that's always true. I can just send you the string, yes. I don't have to do anything else. So how can I prove this? I can prove it by showing that I know a value. I know, it I know a way to decommit this string that gives me an identity that, it, that has a, an age within that range. And because of computational binding, 
that means that actually that's what I committed to. Because if I, uh, uh, if I could give you two, two possible things, then it wouldn't be computationally, then I would break bind the binding property of the commitment. So what that means in, in a generic sense, by the way, is if you have some protocol, any protocol that you proved secure with perfectly binding commitments, and you use zero-knowledge proofs, and now you want to use statistically hiding commitments, zero-knowledge proofs no longer su suffice, and you actually need zero-knowledge proofs of knowledge. Okay, so anywhere we're using statistically hiding commitments, instead of perfectly binding, uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, perfectly binding ones, you actually have to use a proof of knowledge instead. Okay, and identification schemes we talked about beforehand. I, I have a public key H. I want to. To authenticate, I want to prove another discrete log. That has to be a zero-knowledge proof of knowledge because otherwise uh, it's trivial. 